famed author Clive Cussler. The hero Dirk Pitt. 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 Pit stop. Pit stop. Pit stop. Pit stop. Pit stop is up and coming. Pit stop. The Mac Bolan episode. With Topper and Nancy and special guest Stephanie. I apparently broke my foot on Thursday. Congratulations. I just have tendonitis in my ankles, so. Well, I'm glad you both went to get your universal health care that we here in America are jealous of, and you guys were just don't get it. You just ignore it. <laughs> it's like spiteful. <laughs> it's like having a piece of cake beautifully on the counter and no one eats. That's fair. In my defense, I thought that my foot was only bruised and it would get better. And now the bruise has spread to my toes and my toes have changed color. So I felt that deserved a second look. You, that is true. This this isn't the 30s. You can't die on your kids. They're not. <laughs> in this economy, they won't survive. You have to live. The doctor wasn't even that concerned. Like, it was basically, if you can still walk on it, you know, ice, compression, take Motrin now and then. It'll heal up, and we'll get the x-ray just to make sure nothing's completely fucked in there. Yeah, especially if your, co your toes are a different color. Well, that's... <laughs> that happened to my father-in-law, like, last week, and that's, like, a sign of a deeper issue. So the, the toes being a different color is wolf. So are you both injured on the same side? Uh, mine's both sides, actually, because what I did oh. was I gave myself tendonitis. And then in an effort to... Because um, I was favoring my right ankle, I then also had tendonitis in my left ankle. Oh, well, because you were compensating. So I also went to the walk-in, and I was just like, my ankles hurt right here. And she's like, that's Achilles tendonitis. The diagnosis is easy. The recovery is hard. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> so it was almost the, the uh, line that we got from Dr. McEwen that I still remember, which is, it'll either get better or it won't. Yeah. <laughs> Best diagnosis ever. One of my doctors says, the bleeding stops eventually. Yeah, one way <laughs> or the other. You run out of blood. I mean, you want me? Exactly. It's the matter will be settled. Yes. All right, so this is our first episode of The Pit Stop, huh? Yes. This is exciting. <laughs> uh, the title that you came up with, which is absolutely perfect for every time we break character and do something fun. Do something for us. Or it'll be completely con confusing to people who think this is a NASCAR podcast. <laughs> Pit has two T's. Hey, NASCAR. Welcome you. Hey, put two T's in it. It's fine. I'll make the, the episode art an extreme close-up of Mac Boland's face and nobody will know what's going on. Actually, I'm no, I'm going to make the, the album art the close-up of Don Pendleton's face, which is the first slide. So I'll get to that in a second. That, I can't wait. Pendleton is, isn't that a type of shoe as well? It's a blanket. Like, you get, like, Pendleton blankets. Those are, like, the American version of Hudson's Bay blankets. Hudson Bay makes great sweaters. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame about all the genocide, but other than that, they're pretty great. <laughs> I was going to say, no. at least we're good for something. You know, it's, it's, you could feel it in the quality. Like, just a little despotism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a quality genocide. Yeah, Pendleton is like a town in Oregon um, that has a huge um, a huge rodeo and also makes blankets. I don't know. I don't make the rules. And I know I've heard of Camp Pendleton, which is apparently... Marine Corps Base, Camp Pendleton. That's in San Francisco. Yes. Right? I appreciate that you're letting me wildly go off topic with like three minutes. Are you kidding? Our, our show. Well, we, our, we never start on topic. And my sister was stationed at Camp Pendleton because she was, I don't know if you know this, my sister is in the Coast Guard. She was an ice maker, an ice sculptor for the Coast Guard. Talk about ridiculous jobs. What rank is that? I don't know. I'll ask her. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. What are the qualifications to become an ice sculptor for the Coast Guard? She went right out of high school. Oh, okay. So she had no skills. Okay. Or like less than no skills. They, they internally, there's an internal training program for the elite ice sculpting forces. But why was she selected? Like some people have to like clean up porta potties. Yeah. Oh, I, I get she's not the strongest swimmer. She's not going to be on 
search and rescue, but that's a, a sweet gig to do yeah, ice no sculptures kidding. at Camp Pendleton. She went all over the world doing ice sculptures. I, I, ice sculpting for events. Huh. That's impressive that they need a full-time ice sculptor. I just can't believe how many ridiculous jobs are out there. I have a friend, <laughs> Stephanie, that does linens, that does... Oh, you mentioned this. She's a fabric coordinator for a person. And she coordinates, like, the curtains and, like, the sofa pillows and the bedding and the blankets and the towels for a resort and a wealthy person. And she makes high six figures. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I know somebody... I've never heard of this job. They don't tell you about these jobs in high school. <laughs> no. I know somebody who, well, the first key was marrying rich. But her job is essentially, um, she's the person who picks the carpet for uh, hotels and conference centers, like the hallway carpets. She chooses those. That's, yeah, interior design. <laughs> Somebody has to. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Custler Hustlers. This is the first episode of the Pit Stop version of this podcast. We are live to tape with, what would you like to be called? I can just be Steph. I've always Steph. <laughs> we are joined live to tape with Steph and co-host Topper. Hello. Hello. I'm speaking to you deep from the closet. I can see that you are... You can come out of the closet. It's 2024. Love is love. That's true. That's true. <laughs> no way. She has the best sound dampening right now. I actually do have the best sound dampening. And the issue is that my neighbor's dogs... Um, my two neighbor's dogs are fighting. And they're barking at each other at the fence. And so if I sit where I was going to sit... All you can hear in the background is dogs barking. Oh, that's okay. I usually have my dogs barking or... Yeah. Um, it's been constant rain here, but if there's a, a ray of sunshine, people are on their ATVs up and down the road. Yeah. Well, there's a whole mountain they could go up, but yeah. left and right are on a road is the most fun. Yeah. You can go faster that way. Usually that's what's happening during recording. Our, our last episode had your dog as a co-host there for a while. Oh, yes. They were on it that time. <laughs> And I, by that, I mean drugs. I give them pure crack cocaine. It's good for their coat. Keeps them healthy. Oh, keeps them shiny. Perfect. And skinny. You know, I worked with a girl who was on a cocaine vodka diet. Not as skinny as you think. Huh. <laughs> I think she was just puffy. Uh, re retaining water. Yeah. So tell us about Mac <laughs> Bowen. Already. So my original plan for this was to do screen sharing and have slides. I'll, uh, well, there's your problem. But Zencaster still doesn't have screen sharing. And they said three years ago they were going to have it. And the help desk person, who is probably an AI, that I talked to said they're still going to have it. But they don't. So I'm going to send you guys, not really slides, but just pictures over Discord. So I could at least get some kind of live reaction here. All right. And this is the first Pit Stop episode ever. And I decided to do it on Donald Eugene Pendleton, the author of the Mac Bolin books, and as we'll get to, about 800 other things. So, I've, seen, I've, I've sent you guys slide number one, which is, what, like, every Don Pendleton picture kind of looks like that. Hate to do this right off the bat, but the guy who was in the movie about killing Hitler and Bigfoot, what's his name? <laughs> oh, uh, Sam Elliott? Yes, Sam Elliott. This looks like Sam Elliott's gay brother. <laughs> That's a great mustache. What a head of hair. That I'll we're looking that. on this, this guy. Yeah, in, in every picture, he looks like he was just taught how to smile. Mm hmm Or he just stubbed his toe, and he's trying to be graceful about it. <laughs> he just broke his foot. He's waiting for that free health care. Yeah. He is an incredible man. I have a script here. If, if people have to deviate, by all means, that's what we do here. So, Donald Eugene Pendleton. All we do, Step. All we do is deviate. Perfect. Uh, born December 12th, 1927 which is the year the first Model A was sold. Uh, at the age of 14, he forged his papers and joined the Navy to fight in World War II. I, my uncle, or family friend who was called Uncle Larry, didn't even have to forge his papers. He was 13. His dad just took him <laughs> and said, I'm going to jail. He's got no place to go. Oh, his works. dad had to report to jail the next day and mom was dead. They'll forge his papers for him. Just, yeah. Child care. You, you were a married man at 12. Yeah. It's fine. No notes. <laughs> yeah, cigarette addiction that you just gave up? Yeah, the world before and after World War II is, like, unrecognizable in so many social ways, including, you oh, know, 14-year-olds signing up to go fight in the Navy. 
Well, it's good because their little hands can get in the torpedo <laughs> things. And they can handle the fine moving machinery really well. Yeah. Loading tiny bullets. And if it doesn't go well, like, how many more 14-year-olds are there out there anyway? We keep making more. It's like Doritos. We sure do. That, this was also back in the days where you had eight kids just to make sure most of them, or some of them, made it to adulthood. Yeah, and, and you two. You two. I'm looking at both of you. Steph and Topper. Those are the people that walked it off, and they were tough guys, and they rubbed dirt in it, and they died <laughs> at 50. Yeah. And their kids were poor and had to go to war. So go see doctors. Okay. Fine. We did. We did. God. I, you did good. You did good. Uh, later on, he re-upped to fight in Korea and fought in Korea in the Navy. Uh, when he decided to finally stop getting shot at, he worked as a telegraph operator for the Southern Pacific Railroad. He was an air traffic controller. He was an undisclosed worker for Martin Marietti, which was now known as Lockheed Martin. Uh, he worked on the Titan missile program. He was an engineer at NASA during the Apollo missions. And he was one of the engineers working on the C-5 Galaxy aircraft program. Because these were all just the sort of jobs you could get if you asked nicely. Sounds like a casual, not a detail-oriented <laughs> guy. Laid back. Loosey-goosey. With that kind of resume. Yeah. He had Navy experience. In the 50s and 60s, you could just walk in and be like, I'd like to be an engineer. And they say, <laughs> yes, white male. Yes. You should be a white an engineer. And they're like, you don't need four years of school and four years of articling. Don't worry about it. Just, uh, here's a ring. It's from a, it's from a bridge that killed a bunch of people, so <laughs> do better than that. Yeah. I'm guessing back in the old days, it was a it was a ring made from a missile that misfired. Just extra bridge poles. They're called bridge poles, right? Just yeah. add extra. Bri nobody will, will notice. Or flying buttresses to the bridge. No one will notice. Yeah. Oh, you should do a pit stop about bridges. Oh. No. <laughs> you should do a pit stop about bridges. <laughs> I do. I have nightmares about bridges all the time. I mean, so do I, but it's also my job. And my job. The nightmares are about specific bridges. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That's very vivid sounding. <laughs> and extra horrific. Because it's personal to you now. <laughs> yeah, well. I only have nightmares about that one bridge that was up by the Yukon we were doing inspections on that we had to drive over three more times in order to finish the bridge inspections and then leave the area, and both ends were off the bearings. This bridge was being held in place by by, by friction from, like, the mudslides. Yeah, that was one of the reasons that when I developed my new training for my new bridge inspectors, uh, the first thing I teach them is, before you drive over the bridge, inspect it. That's... <laughs> I made a road trip last week to D.C., through Baltimore. Ooh, and, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, inspect your bridges. <laughs> uh, listeners, this is happening. We just lost a bridge. Listeners, last week. Go listen to the, well, well there's your problem, uh, news update on that one. Yes, the flag, it's named after Francis Scott Key, the guy who penned our national anthem. And in the anthem is the line, and the flag was still there. The flag is still there, bridge is not. Anyway. 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 Uh, moving on. Mac Owen. I have sent slide number two. Our beautiful mustachioed. <laughs> Good teeth, too. Godmakers. Is it? Is that a demon orgy? I'm reading it. Sorry. I, it's very small type. Beyond knowing is feeling. Beyond strange in a strange land. The Godmakers by Dan Britton. The incredible story will make you squirm. It may even make you angry. But it will also send chills up and down your spine. With every mind-blowing page. And the visual is a woman with gray hair at the top of a pile of humans that seem to be intertwined. Like when you wash a bunch of jeans and they all get tumble dried together and you can't get them out. That's what this picture looks like. But people instead of jeans. Yeah, it's like a huge people tentacle with a lady at the top. It's a rat king of people with a lady on the kind of sitting on top of it. Her lower torso is ensconced in the... <laughs> hodgepodge. She looks like she's having a great time, unsure about the, everybody else. What is that? <laughs> All right, I've okay, restarted the so we, I restarted the recording. We left the previous podcast and you had told us that Mark Bolin has that he, he's an engineer. He's writing <laughs> books. Right. Mac Bolin. And he dropped out of writing school. Uh Mac Bolin is the character. We're talking about Don Pendleton right now. <laughs> Pendleton. All right. 
Don Pendleton outdoes me by signing up for a creative writing correspondence course, which he drops out of because he already got published. To be fair, those are for, like, prisoners, not... <laughs> He's a free be... man, he could just go to a course. You did everything like that back in the day. You, you ordered houses by correspondence out of a catalog. I, I looked at one when we were looking for houses. Sears had lovely <laughs> pocket doors on their houses. Anyway, uh, his first published book was Frame Up Fresno, which was the first of the Stuart Mann novels. That was his first character was Stuart Mann. He wrote under the pen name of Stephen Gregory. Uh, does Mann have one N or two? Two N's. Okay. <laughs> also, this comes up later because one of his other characters is Joe Cop with two P's. Oh, good. He oh, is good. the master at coming up with names. Uh, some of the other titles for Stuart Mann were... The Insatiables, Sexy Goddess, The Sexy Saints, and The Hot One. Do you think these um, titles came from a place of obsession, or was he just trying <laughs> to be smart about the market? Or was he think, like a 14-year-old boy? I think smart about the market. Okay. Because by this time, well, he was 40. He was looking at the market. He was looking at what was selling. And pulp adventure novels were big. Uh, he also wrote some early political thrillers. Where Everybody Dies, with names like Revolt and The Olympians and Population Doomsday. And he also wrote some speculative sci-fi, which was the slide that I sent, as Dan Britton, such as The God Makers. So he was kind of writing everything at the time. Okay. The political stuff, no spoilers, everyone dies? Good to know. <laughs> yeah. That's politics, right? Like Hamlet style, or like one nuclear explosion? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, because... For a lot of those old books, I can't even find the cover art, and it's like a one-sentence write-up of the plot. Oh, gotcha. But I read one person writing about the books and talks about how most of the characters die by the end of the book, but the hero wins. So, you know, people dying left and right, constant gunfights and shootouts. But it was in 1969 that he hit upon what was going to make him a ridiculous multimillionaire, sending slide number three. Okay. Which was Mac Bolin, and the first book was The War Against the Mafia, which has a lot more of a plot and a lot stranger of a plot than I would have guessed for looking at the cover. I mean, he's got a rocket launcher. <laughs> he's got everything by the end of that book. Nice. So I'm going to get more to Mac Bolin at the end. Right now we're just sort of going through the overview of Dawn's life and the publishing. So in the 80s Did and 90s... Did he specify a mafia, or was it just back then assumed it was an Italian mafia? I think they assumed it was the Italian Mafia. It was very specifically the Italian Mafia, which oh. I guess was really, really big at the time. I guess, um, since The Godfather, that name has been appropriated. <laughs> so it is. There's lots of mafias now. <laughs> Far too many. More than one executioner could possibly keep up with. Please eliminate three. I am not a crackpot. Let's see. With the Mac Bolan books, uh, Don Pendleton is credited as creating the action-adventure novel genre. Although other people say that he only modernized it because up until then, it was stuff like Nazi hunters and Doc Savage and white people going into deepest, darkest Africa and killing people. That is, that was very popular. That was uh, <laughs> King Kong, was that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so this guy was around before Clive Cussler. Oh, yeah. He's the Hydrox of Clive Cussler. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh, this book was 1967. So, like, I think the last Mac Bolan book that he wrote... Well, no, that was early 80s. So, yeah, there was already, like, 10 or 12 Executioner books out when the first Dirk Pitt novel came out. And having listened to one or two of the audiobooks, the formula is almost exactly the same. So these are, like, I just... Because I'm so unfamiliar with the entire genre, this is basically just Harlequin romances for dudes. Oh, one hundred. Like they're they're ten cents. You buy them at the hardware store because, like, the Harlequins <laughs> Sierra would have been at the grocery store, and that's not where men go. I bet they sold these in hardware stores. No, they could hide their purchases at the hardware store. It would look weird if they went to the grocery store. Yeah, they're like on a shelf with like some Louis Lamars. I assume Louis Lamar was my other option for doing a pit stop on, so that might be my next one. Okay. <laughs> Because that, that might be... The, Sorry to get ahead of you in that case. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the, the only uh, singular book series with more titles than The Executioner. Okay. There are all these books... Oh, it's The Executioner 1, 2... How many Executioner books are there? 
Uh, we will get to that. The uh, With the okay. original series, it was 39, and Don Pendleton wrote 38 of them. Now, I saw a movie this weekend uh, called The Beekeeper with Jason Statham. <laughs> oh, I've seen ads for that. And it was a much as much of a movie as you can call this creation. It was fabricated entirely of cliches and tropes and must oh. have come out of the vending machine. There was nothing original about this. <laughs> Barely a movie. I'm not sure if Jason ever spoke or just grunted <laughs> i can't believe how many jason statham uh movies there are where he just wanders around and grunts and kills people uh i went a stretch when we had netflix and i forget whatever our second streaming service was i think it was like amazon prime and there was like five of them on there where he just wanders around wanders around london and kills people that's the modern day version of this yeah the modern day version is just the actors who pump out four of these per year Oh, but a moment of silence. Silence for Bruce Willis. So if we're just looking for something that's like super formulaic, formulaic pumped out four ti- four or five times a year. So Chuck Tingle? <laughs> yes. Uh, Chuck Tingle. Okay. And Taylor Swift? Yeah. Chuck Tingle before he discovered pounding you in the butt. Or getting pounded. Should I leave? What is this? Huh? Are, do you not know who Chuck Tingle is? I do not. It's but it oh, sounds naughty. Oh, if you do have God. something going on, I can go somewhere. <laughs> that might be a future. Okay, that might be have to be a future episode. In real time, I'm going to need Nancy to Google Chuck Tingle and just <laughs> we're going to record it for the next minute or so. Okay, we're just going to wait. Okay, I'm googling C H U C K Tingle. Spell Tingle. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Is this about the tickling guy? That's wow. I like the guy in the Scrabble. There's well, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> I am I. I'm looking at a thumbnail of a I hope of age man topless in front of um a wordly board <laughs> and another face is superimposed on that board, so it's a thoroughly hanging. But just a large face. Uh, yep. And this seems to be a series of topless men books. I, you know, we don't have enough of the male, of, of, of the female gaze for books. <laughs> uh, His books are men, women, non-binary. They're, they're everything. Yeah, he's, he's not. Everything and nothing th- all at once. Choosy. <laughs> um, there's one with an alligator head. Okay. Interesting um, target audience he's going for. Chuck Tingler's Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. yeah. An erotic thriller. Probably. The target audience was weirdos on the internet, and he has since spread. Like, he's almost gone mainstream now. Uh, he's being invited to library conferences and uh, fantasy conventions all across the country. There was one where, because of fun right-wing things happening in that state, his booking was canceled, and, like, half the other people speaking at that conference also canceled out of solidarity. And they were forced to, like, reinstate him and everybody else. Yeah, that happens a lot here. So he's a wonderful person who writes weird, weird stuff. I wonder if... It it looks like this guy is the Banksy of gay porn, so he doesn't (laughs) reveal his identity because he (laughs) shows up to these conferences with a pink bag over his head as he is portrayed by his thumbnail. Yes, he does. Excellent. Anyway, uh, that was our Chuck Tingle moment. He looks like a Pepto-Bismol packet. I, I sent you something you need to forward to Nancy, by the way, because I don't have I'm her sending it. I'm sending it. It's just my favorite Chuck Tingle one that was on the first page. It's great. I love how the T-Rex has hair. Oh! I know. Is this the whole thing the title? Because, damn. I look yep. at yes, it a is. saucy young person in a, a flurry black dress standing next to an alligator being with long, lovely red hair, a uh, classic sharp tooth a gape maw of an an alligator and uh the title is absolutely no thoughts of pounding during my fun day with this kind of t-rex because i'm a romantic and asexual and that's a wonderful vile reason way to uh to prove the love is real the sentiment is absolutely true uh no notes it's perfect i'm glad you approve all right, now we are still on the first page of my script here. So. Sorry. <laughs> Forget anyway. about the author. Cut to the book. Yeah, <laughs> there's 8,000 of these books called Executioners. Yeah, okay. Tell so me about I'm... this guy, the new Dirk Pitt, or the Hydrox Dirk Pitt. 
Well, the next paragraph was Mac Boland. So, the first book and the next 39 original Mac Boland books are about his endless vendetta against the Mafia. So, the very was... first first book... Is this all they're still alive? Uh, no, he passed away in 2020? No, 2012, Did they I bury think. him with a dead horse? <laughs> his his, <laughs> his wife is still alive, and as we'll also learn later, she's like been in charge of uh, releasing Mac Boland comic books and stuff. Oh, Jesus, they won't stop. Okay. Nope, there's more. Uh, it was almost a movie three times, but I'm still getting ahead of myself. All right, so Mac Boland is a Vietnam veteran, an army sergeant, known as both the executioner for his ludicrous kill counts and Sergeant Mercy for his selfless acts to aid the civilians in Vietnam. He has like a half dozen catchphrases, he speaks in cliches, and he's good at everything. Oh, so he is Dirk Pitt. Yeah, he's he's all of these like ultra fantasized power fantasy male macho action heroes. He has all things to all men <laughs> and maybe one lucky woman. One at a time. Possibly. Uh, two women, but they both died because yeah. that's because that's what happens in these books. Women don't make it out usually. They don't make it to the next books as a rule. I sent slide number four. It was with book number sixteen that the publishers realized that they really had something here and they started hiring ghostwriters to pump out more books. And Don Pendleton only found out when they changed the numbering on his on the book he was writing from sixteen to seventeen because they had just put out book number sixteen by Jim Peterson. I love it. It's called The Sicilian Slaughter. It <laughs> reminds me of a uh... Every title is like that. On the, my daughter, when she was younger, would watch the Disney Channel nonstop, and there's a lot of bizarre programming there. But they had a mafia show, and instead of the bullets being bullets, the mafia was having a gunfight with meatballs. <laughs> and this cover of the book with the guy in the big gun looks like that, like he's going to shoot a meatball at somebody. 100%. I also like that he appears to be driving a tractor. <laughs> That's either a tractor or like a race car from the 1910s. Well, I mean... That's true. It could be either one. It appears to be like a an early 40s um, Massey Ferguson. So I think that the hairstyle that appears to be blowing in the wind really kind of overstates the top speed. <laughs> As he's doing a sick drive-by of an Italian farm at night. As he's doing a sick... You can't bring science into these books. Physics has no place okay. with adventure men. Well... I mean, maybe automatic weapons are um, windy. I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Massive blowback off that machine gun. Like they, they sort of move a lot of air. I'm not really sure. But um, but yeah, that from my look, that would appear to be an early model of Massey Ferguson tractor. So uh, when Don Pendleton found out that they were putting out books that he hadn't written, uh, he took the whole IP over to a new publisher, New American Library, and away from his first publisher, Pinnacle. So eventually they settled and there were no more ghostwriters for a while. He did the next 21 books and then he retired from Mac Boland because at this point there can't be any mafia left and he was really tired. And also his books started getting weirder and weirder and he was like, I can't be as weird as I want to be with Mac Boland. So he retired from that and that was when in book 39... Mac Boland fakes his death with the help of the government, and that's when the spin-offs start. Oh! And afterwards, the books were Don Pendleton's Mac Boland, rather than Mac Boland by Don Pendleton. And the author's name was only mentioned, like, the, whoever actually wrote that book, was only mentioned in small print on the copyright page as a provider of a contribution. Oh, wow. That's wow. why. That's very odd. Man, I got, like, four pages here on Mac Boland. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, what were the total... Okay, Mac Boland, Phoenix Flores, Abel Team. All right, so in so in total, for all of the Mac Boland books, which we're going to get into, there were a total of 631 novels. Wow. Uh, which, by the end, were being released monthly. Uh, 453 regular executioner titles and 178 Super Bolands, which were twice as long, which meant they were actually novel-sized. Because each of these books is like 200 pages. Like, you could do one in an afternoon if you wanted to. So this guy right. had a sweatshop of small children cranking these books out, <laughs> right? Basically. It was like maybe a, a, a Mad Libs type format. Uh, yeah. Uh, afterwards, they were put out by Harlequin. So they were put out by the by the romance people who, ha oh. who had, in their own words, a stable of ghostwriters. And they were good at putting out Harlequin. <laughs> they, they really were. 
That was kind of their uh, business model. Yeah. Oh, a new image is coming in. Let's see. So slide number five. There is, is basically how Mac Bolin is portrayed in all the books. So tall, blue eyes, dark hair, dark leathered uh, skin. Does this sound like Dirk Pitt to anyone else? Yes, he's a little bit like leathery, a bit more <laughs> sun damaged, yeah. perhaps. And he's yeah. got cheekbones for days. Yeah. So Mac Bolin was born in 1939 in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he's the oldest of three children. He joined the army when he was an 18 when he was 18 and served two tours in Vietnam. Although when the books start getting published in the 90s and the 2000s, they mention Vietnam a lot less because it would make him incredibly old. Yes, I that's would imagine true. so. <laughs> as, you know, as time is linear, so that's how that works out. And he basically has Rambo's backstory because he has 90 confirmed kills in Vietnam. He's a master infiltrator, scout, armorer, and sniper. And Rambo First Blood was written in 1972, so that was when the 10th Mac Bolan book came out. So there's a good chance Rambo is ripping off Mac Bola. And, well, I just realized who he looks like in that picture, by the way. Uh-oh. Oh! Uh, if they ever need to cast somebody for him, may I propose Jimmy Smits? Ooh. Oh, I could see that. As a slightly older and beaten down Mac Bolan, I can, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, see that. The major difference between Mac Bolan and Rambo is Mac Bolan is completely unbothered by his time in war and his dozens and dozens of kills, whereas Rambo is like walking trauma. He's completely mentally destroyed. Also, I didn't know this uh, during my research. Rambo was written by a Canadian and First Blood was his very first book. Is that why it was filmed in Canada? I think that's just a wonderful coincidence, but maybe. Okay. Stephanie, my sister texted back. She was an E6. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if, like, if on purpose they are describing Mac Bolan as a psychopath, but one of the novels does state that an army psychiatrist is quoted as saying, so it's a quote within a quote, that most soldiers can be a sniper once successfully, but it's the ability to continue to do so that separates Bolan from other men. And this comes up a lot in the Mac Bolan books about uh, when he's killing the mafia and whatnot is... This isn't war. This isn't vengeance. This isn't an, an emotional overreaction. This is like his duty. It's his higher calling. So he feels that all all of the killing he's doing, like he has to do. Oh, he's going to cleanse the world with fire, huh? It's necessary. Yes. That's well. That seems psychotic. Yes, Ab I would agree with the shrink there. That is <laughs> absolutely not emotional. That is not. Nobody's asking him to do local population control, right? Yep. He's just taking this on himself. It's so. Uh, glory project. So the first book that starts all this off, while he's in Vietnam, uh, his dad has a heart attack and can't work at the steel mill and is forced to borrow money from a crooked bank run by the Massachusetts Mafia that are being hassled by the Mafia. Uh, Mac's younger sister, Cindy, starts paying the money on the side by prostituting herself out. Mac's younger brother, Johnny, finds out about this. And the whole thing ends with Mac's dad turning the gun on the kids, his wife, and himself, and Mac's whole Bol Mac Bolin's whole family kills himself. Oh. Mac finds out about this and flies back. Mac's brother Johnny survived just barely, and he tells him it was the Mafia. And thus begins 39 straight books killing the Mafia. I see. Well, the dad did the murder-suicide wrong. Usually that's supposed to be a victimless crime. That's a gentle Nick joke. And, uh... <laughs> So, out of all the, the takeaway that this guy has is, my dad murdered my sister, tried to kill my brother, Mafia. Yeah, like, so, all of this incredible trauma. This is exactly the beekeeper, note for note. It was all the Mafia's fault. Oh, of course. Uh, he kills anybody who's even remotely associated with the Mafia, like, including messenger boys. Every few books, he'll, like, spare one of them because he sees good in their heart, and they'll come back later on and help out in, like, a different book. And in all the original books, despite the fact that, like, by, by the end of the first book, he has plastic explosives and rocket launchers and stuff, uh, he never kills bystanders or innocents, no matter, like... Oh, I was going to ask about collateral damage. <laughs> apparently, basically zero. Even with the rocket launcher. Even with the rocket launcher. That's very passionate. That, that's incredible aim. Because these are action fantasies. In those first 39 books, he fell in love twice. Uh, once with a woman in book one. Who died and the second was a federal agent named april rose near the end of the original run 
which also doesn't last long. She didn't rise again? Uh, I don't know. I'm finding... I found evidence that she was in like a whole bunch of books and he's trying not to get too close to her in case she dies but I do think she oh. dies eventually at some point mm. because she is a government agent working with Mac Bolan and she's like helped get him off of charges and helped him escape the feds because also in most of these the government is also out to get him oh so when she comes back it's not April Rose it's April has risen <laughs> yes oh that would have been the name of book 40 absolutely April has risen uh, but that said, each book does have a female lead, I'm making air quotes, uh, who is tough, gutsy, brave, usually redhead, and sleeps with Mac. She's got a type. <laughs> yes. They have to be gutsy. But to point out that Mac isn't just a meathead, he starts off almost every single book by reading or discussing famous literature, in particular Cervantes and Don Quixote. I hate those people. This guy should <laughs> kill himself. <laughs> No, nobody should start anything like that. Nobody cares. <laughs> oh, taps in my captain. Don't get to the meeting, Tim. <laughs> We're here to talk about burger sales. Uh, there are guns he uses in almost every book, including the Weatherby Mark V sniper rifle, which he acquired. I, I don't. I don't know exactly which book it is, but there was a there was a Vietnam sniper, like the second most uh, successful sniper in Vietnam, who was sent to kill Mac. And Mac eventually kills him and takes his gun and uses that for a few, uh, few books. And the 44 Automag, and the Beretta 93, and the Desert Eagle. Like, he just uses whatever the biggest gun in pop culture is. Desert Eagle is four and a half pounds. That's <laughs> like an aerobic hitman. That's that's a lot of... Arm curls. So if he only ever uses one gun, gun at a time, so his gun bills are not very high? His gun bills like, aren't... Like, usually... In, in 1969 in the U.S., he could probably get these at the, you know, the corner market for a nickel. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking, like, you know, he's sort of limiting himself to, like, one gun for multiple books, which I feel is a real deviation from the genre. Uh, based on the plots I've read, like, yeah, he starts off with one gun or two guns, but by the end of each book, he realizes, like, okay, I have to get serious now, and he, like, talks to an old army buddy and gets some explosives, or he gets a grenade launcher, or he gets, like, the oh. super heavy machine guns or something. Like, it always escalates, and he's always, like, surprised that it's escalating. Oh. Because like, oh, he's never done this before. I need a bigger gun. I can believe that. I saw my grandfather shoot a horn's nest with a gun. Sometimes men make really bizarre decisions. I once watched my grandpa uh, light a hornet's nest on fire. But um, at this time, my, my grandfather... You're supposed to do that. Yeah, but uh, you have to realize that... Uh, <laughs> you have to leave the area at some point. At that point, we lived in an area that is like quite wildfire prone and... It was August. Oh, no, you're not supposed to do that. I take it back. I take it back. <laughs> Flaming hornets everywhere. So he, he burnt like half the tree. <laughs> it was pretty entertaining. But like grandma Plus, wasn't. How many people died? Thrilled. I mean, it was just one tree. So oh, okay. none of us. We we're all good. But yeah, it was definitely one of those. What the heck is grandpa doing situations? Oh, I was in the yard with grandpa. He was Scottish. I never understood a word he said. But he had his double barrel shotgun. And I was little, like five. And my little grandmother came out. She saw what he was doing. She took me and like ran into the house. And as he gets to the door, because he's trying to run into the house to escape what he just shot at, she just slams the door in his face. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was a, a very entertaining day. Learn your lesson. He did. <laughs> and then he <laughs> well, died. that's good. Immediately. Yeah. All right. I'm actually about halfway through the script here, so we're moving along pretty good. The next part that I had was there's not exactly a subtle take on politics from Mac Bolan, or I'm guessing Don Pendleton. He is a hardline right winger to the point where hippies, commies, socialists, left wingers, and peaceniks are either comic relief, ineffectual pansies, or just like weird straw man hypocrites who are just as prone to crime in every single book. So this is a real Charles Burns and a street crime. Yeah. If you're not on the street and narrow, you're guilty. No questions yeah. asked. Yeah. Uh, Mac Bolan goes on chapters long ramblings about the, the necessity of violence and how his war everlasting, and I should point, point out that war everlasting is in capital letters, is the only way to keep civilization standing with an iron fist. Well. And he himself, like Don, Don Pendleton has stated that he himself and Mac Bolan, he wrote these books as a direct response to the anti-war views of the people who were against Vietnam. Interesting take for someone who was in World War II to be like, yeah, war is great. Let's have more. <laughs> yeah. 
it's rad. He clearly had a really good time at war. War is how the world yeah. works. <laughs> Something that is both normal and possible to do. Yes. Oh, for me, one second. I have to let dogs in. They're scraping and being loud. Yay, dog co-hosts. I just made one of the kids come take the cat away because she was trying to eat the <laughs> microphone. Oh, we didn't get that on video? Well, she was trying to eat the mic. I was oh. a little bit concerned it was actually going to um, come through, so... Mouse is sitting next to me and bathing herself. Okay, I'm back. What's what's happening? What did I just walk in on? Uh, wh- oh, one of the cats was upstairs trying to eat the microphone, and then the other cat is next to me and like loudly bathing herself and making weird eye contact. But the context is is that that cat's name is Mouse. Right now, I have a Chihuahua who's on my shoulder, who will breathe and growl into the microphone. That's not me sounding like a gremlin. That's an actual <laughs> gremlin. Oh, good. The this time. Around this time was the uh, the Vengeance movie's Death Wish. So this was... The entire society was just like... Killing people solves problems. And that's where we've built modern day... Well, we're on the precipice of World War Three right now, so... Maybe War Forever is just in the zeitgeist. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the first Death Wish was 1974. I do think that was definitely the... Like, heavily. The response to like, the hippie movement. The hippie fantasy again? We're getting less frequent, sir. Excellent. And I could see Charles Bronson. A young Charles Bronson. You guys are a little younger. You might not remember. He was gorgeous. He had very large hair. It kind of looks like they were shopping for somebody who looked like uh, Mac Bolan. At least as portrayed yeah. on the cover for the Death Wish movies. Yes. There's certainly a uh, turtleneck trend. I think that was the manliest man you could be. It's an aesthetic for sure. <laughs> you have to be very manly. Have Oh, my daughter was on a, a class trip. She met a congressman. Her takeaway was his great hair. So this guy has great leadership hair. Yes. He's a natural leader. Yeah, there, there's no shave his sideburns. So A, a good American. Yeah. On that note, uh, in a LA Times interview in 1988, Don Pendleton says that he doesn't think his books glamorize violence. Oh. He says, my idea was not a psychopath, not people who want to go out and slay and sleep and see blood flow. My idea of a hero is somebody who would rather be doing almost anything but that, but takes it up instead as a calling, as a service, hating it the whole time, but doing it because it's absolutely necessary. Now this is a hero, a truly courageous person, somebody who loves the thrill of going out there and smearing blood as a psychopath. So Mac Boland doesn't want to spend... 651 books killing the mafia and terrorists, but gosh darn it, nobody else will. The last bit was me. So he prefers his leading man to be deeply traumatized, but just keeping it in? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you just suppress all that. <laughs> if you don't talk about it, it's not real. Exactly. All right, so after Mac Bolan fakes his death, uh, there are three separate zones of spinoff. So first up is Abel Team. Oh, this is... Able team sounds and looks really offensive, actually, like a <laughs> like it's a joke about <laughs> differently abled people. But no, it is an actual book. Um, it looks farcical. It's called Able Team in a font that is um, collegiate, I think. So, yeah, it doesn't blend into the rest of the cover at all, stylistically. It's called Cairo Countdown. I love alliteration. And it has three dorks pointing guns randomly in random directions <laughs> and all of them yes. have lots of hair these three guys in the cupboard and, and none of them are looking in the same direction either there's a lot happening i think the author's name yeah the author's name really does it for me it's hard to see because of the fantastic hair but it appears to be D- dick, dick stivers dick stivers i believe so wow that's a that's a man's name that is a hell of a man's name so uh the Executioner Book 2, so uh, in an earlier slide, is called Death Squad. And that is the second Mac Bolan book where he recruits all of his buddies uh, from Vietnam to launch, like, a huge attack on the Mafia. And by the end of that book, almost everybody dies. But the three who live uh, go on to form Able Team with Mac Bolan after Mac Bolan fakes his death. And I just want to read through all the names that Able Team was originally made up of. So there's Herman Gadgets Schwartz, who's the tech whiz. There is Rosario Paul Bancanales, called Paul because he's the politician of the group, born in East L.A. to hardworking immigrants. Uh, there is George Whispering Death Zitka, who is a sneaky scout. William Boom Boom Hoffower, who is a Pennsylvania Quaker. 
Thomas Bloodbrother Loud Elk, a Blackfoot Indian from Montana, who can break necks with his bare hands. Uh, Angelo Chopper Fontanelli, a New Jersey native. Juan Flower Child Andromeda, a Puerto Rican. Uh, James Guns. It, this keeps going. James Gunsmoke Harrington, who is Mac Bolland's flanker in Vietnam, and who was allowed. I don't believe these nicknames. Genuine <laughs> nicknames. Somebody in the bunch is not going to have a cool nickname. It's going to be like Stephen Pink Eye Wazowski or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So James Gunsmoke Harrington was allowed to carry his quick draw six shooters into battle in Vietnam because he was just that good with them. Uh, Mark Deadeye Washington an African-American, and Carl Ironman Lyons, the LAPD detective sworn to bring Mac Bolan in until Mac Bolan saves his life and he's recruited. So, out of all of those... Oh my god, does he invent Rampart? <laughs> only Gadgets, Politician, and Iron Man survive, and they form Able Team for 51 books. And they are, like, the anti-terrorist... So this, this author was buried with a dead horse below and above, <laughs> right? Just for... Symbolism sake. I believe so. So, Able Team fights terrorism outside. Uh, the next slide is Phoenix Force, who fights terrorism inside America. Oh, this is a more military font, and it's green. Uh, yeah. So this is like FBI versus CIA situation. <laughs> Both of these teams work for Stony Man, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Oh, so oh, whenever, oh it's called Argentinian Deadline. Yes. Whenever my husband has a file name that it's a banking crime. So. <laughs> oh. So this team is made up of Yakov Kanselenbogen, a French Israeli commando with a prosthetic arm he keeps gadgets in, Gary Manning, a Canadian demolitions expert, Keo O'Hara, a Japanese martial artist, David McCarter, a British SAS operative. This is like the international team. I may have had that backwards. Maybe Phoenix Force is international terrorism. And Rafael Enciso, a Cuban survivor of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Well, first I would like to point out that they, they've they made one basic error in this, which is that they um, they named the Canadian Gary. There's nobody <laughs> named Gary here. Um, they should have named him Gord. This absolutely should be a Gord. <laughs> like the pumpkin or like a Gordon? A Gordon. Like Gordon. Is <laughs> Gord like a Canadian thing? Because this is always the joke, is that there's no babies named Gord anymore, but there's you know, a lot of men named Gord. Okay. That is Canadian. There's no there's no Gordons. The last Gordon I, I ever heard about was Gordon Shumway. Oh, yeah. Who was Alf. <laughs> Alf. <laughs> that rules. Timely reference for the children <laughs> listening. Yes. <laughs> Phoenix Force also made up of 51 novels and four super novels and several anthologies from 82 to 91. I can't quite see the price of the book in the upper right hand corner can you make that out is that 325 or 225 uh, i believe it's 225 a whole book for 225 get that book for a 20 brand new bargain and both of these are oh, this one a new pic just came in and this looks problematic oh my goodness <laughs> yes i want i wanted this cover specifically and I, I i was so happy to get it in like incredibly high resolution oh wow that is choice <laughs> Holy. So, after Mac Bolan fakes his death, he starts a government agency called Stony Man. And it's sort of like Mission Impossible Force. It's like the extra governmental, off the books black ops team that Mac Bolan is in charge of. And there are some Stony Man books on their own, but eventually Able Team and Phoenix Force are merged into the Stony Man series in 91. Well, I imagine there was a lot of attrition, so you might as well combine teams. Exactly. Yeah, judging by the number of explosions, like, you gotta have, like, four people. The cover of this book is, a the blonde guy looks like Jim J. Bullock. Even though this book, I believe, took place in the 90s. He's wearing very tight pants for a gunman. Good for him. <laughs> the the yeah. main character dude uh, is crouching and looks confused. And then there's a... He looks like Hayden Christensen in Star Wars. Depiction of an African warrior in a headdress and an explosion. It's sort of like um, yes. your Chuck Tingle books here. Like a variety of that. <laughs> yeah. They survive. These, are, these are Action Man covers. So Stony Man runs for another 140 books until 2015 was when the last Mac Bolan story was published. That's a lot of time for feeding this into the psyches of young people. Yes. Uh-huh. 
So from post World War II to now, our youth, mainly the boy youth, have been just reading pulp fiction that glorifies war. What could have gone wrong? I anticipate no problems. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's fine. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure this is not written on the hard drive of many a leader who read this as a child <laughs> who's now in charge of nations. So in 1972, uh, Richard Maybaum, who was known for adapting the Ian Fleming books into movies, was hired to write a Mac Boland screenplay. And the Mac Boland books at this time were, were stamped with soon to be a major motion picture, but it for some reason never happened. Uh, in the 80s, William Friedkin tried to adapt it with Sylvester Stallone as Mac Bolan. Oh, and no, that wouldn't. And Cynthia Rothrock as April Rose, which, I mean, this would have been early sly. I think it could have worked, but that also didn't go anywhere. And why that Cynthia tick? It didn't make <laughs> it far, huh? I know who Fly is. Cynthia fell off the map. Yeah. 2014, Shane Salerno acquired the rights, and then Warner Brothers acquired them from him. And they had initially attached Bradley Cooper to play Mac Bolan. Holy shit. There's <laughs> so much money swimming around this enterprise. The guy's yeah. been dead for oh, 14 yeah. years at this point. And this yeah. would have been this would have been Bradley Cooper's franchise. Like this would have taken him for 10 years. And it was going to be directed by Todd Phillips, uh, the man behind The Hangover and The Joker movie. Mixed bag, okay. Todd Phillips, uh, if you've seen any of his recent movies, is absolutely obsessed with the 1970s new Hollywood, and he was going to make the Mac Bolan movie with Bradley Cooper as, like, a super uh, hard-boiled 1970s, like, old-style action movie. But it also went nowhere. Well, they run up against this disturbing fact when they're making movies in the modern times about the 70s. The reason, one of the reasons the rise of this kind of pulp fiction, the vengeance is mine, I will cleanse the earth with fire, I will cause the heat death of the universe to destroy my enemies, was in, a, in response to the civil rights movement. And it just doesn't, it, it's, the more you look into it, the worse it gets. Yeah, I, I was gonna... <laughs> so you don't want your 70s action hero anymore. I was going to make mention about the um, representation uh, involved in these books and that it, it seems seems lacking to our modern sensibilities, I think would be the polite way of putting it. Oh, yeah. Able Team has both a Puerto Rican and a black. One of each uh, set. Oh, I did one of them also have a First Nations person? Uh, but yes. But I bet that was like their spirit talker, so... That was Thomas Blood Brother Loud Elk. Ouch. A Blackfoot Indian who is a knife expert and who can track, and he breaks necks with his bare hands. Oh. And is totally culturally sensitive. You can't just be like a really good typist. I mean, I think the only way I would be cool with this Bradley Cooper thing that they had discussed is if they managed to get Dallas Goldtooth to play the stereotypical <laughs> First Nations person. Oh, I've got to look up First Nations. Oh my god, that would be amazing. <laughs> but just play it as sarcastically as Dallas Goldtooth could possibly play the stereotypical First Nations person. We're gonna ha have to send Nancy some 1491's videos. I just saw him in a uh, Fallout. Yeah. Oh, was and he he's in that? Fallout? Yeah, awesome. he's in four. Oh, that rules. I didn't know he was in that. He's got the beautiful smile. Yes. All right. Uh, I have sent you another picture. And the closest they got to a movie was Jake Speed from 1986. And it is explicitly a spoof of Mac Bolan. The screenwriter said he was making fun of Mac Bolan. The characters in the movie discuss Mac Bolan. People in the background are reading Mac Bolan books. And it was but written, produced and starring Wayne Crawford and also it has John Hurt as the villain so if, if you look at this picture that's John Hurt in the background with the machine gun and a tuxedo wow I appreciate formal wear you don't see that much these days it's a lost art of you know wearing formal wear um the what was the main character's name the main actor's name in uh, Jake Speed Wayne Crawford yes oh the famous Crawford who's holding a very small woman <laughs> Well, she's on her knees. Yeah. Um, He's one of those guys who's rich enough to make his own movies. That seems like a long way to go for an inside joke. It, it didn't quite work out. I I mean, I, I think he was hoping that the action comedy genre would uh, be bigger than it was. But that was a, a really finicky genre. Because if the action sucks or the comedy sucks, no one's going to like it. I mean, what year did this come out again? 86. 
Oh, okay. So this is right when you have like Nick Gun, Nick Gun two and a half. There's a, a good chance I saw this on TV. Yeah, I was gonna say this was like Police Academy, Naked Gun, you know, Blazing Saddles. Oh, there's what a, a baseball one too. <laughs> yeah, with the guy from Two and a Half Men, Charlie Sheen. Yes, that's it. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the other guys being sarcastic. Oh yeah, Hot Shots. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Darn it, the Hot Shots movies were good, even if Charlie Sheen is problematic. I remember seeing the Hot Shots movies as a 10 or 11 year old and they really were hilarious as an adult that is a finicky genre <laughs> yep yes this is about five years before hot shots so i think they were still trying to get it just really dial that genre in but you can't have a a mac bolan spoof movie without first having mac bolan movies i would assume what do you think cool. but there was also like 500 of those books out by the time so i think they were hoping there was enough of a cultural zeitgeist to be aware of Mac Bolan books that you can make fun of it, but maybe not. M maybe not. Uh, a, a lot of movie podcasts I listen to talk about how that was the main problem with Last Action Hero, because Last Action Hero is Arnold Schwarzenegger making fun of action movies, but he was doing this at his peak of making action movies. Like, he's making fun of movies that had come out that year, and if you're going to spoof it, you kind of have to wait until you're past the peak. You kind of do. You have to be more sympathetic for the jokes to land yeah yeah and he played it pretty straight in that movie he did which i think was the best part it, it was but i can see where it was misunderstood in the era the more i'm looking at the picture of this jake speed uh movie is the tuxedo gunman shooting a volcano at jake <laughs> and is the volcano part crab monster because it seems to have a claw I think that's an explosion happening behind because uh, Jake oh. Speed, Jake Speed on the cover of this is quite, quite uh, literally stepping out of the cover of a book. Yes, it is corny upon corny. Yeah, the tagline is he's rewriting the book on adventure. And they tried to do this image thing. This, they tried to make the, his leg appear to be emerging from the poster. They did the best they could. Yeah, it was the eighty six was a hard time. I I tried to. Yeah, well, that pant, pant leg is doing a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> I um, I looked around to try and find a slightly higher resolution one just to really conceptualize what's going on. And I have to say that in every single one I found, the woman actually gets smaller as it goes. <laughs> like, she just, I swear she's like up to his navel in some of them. <laughs> There's jokes there that I'm not going to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone can make that joke. Take your own jokes, people. I give you permission. Yeah. And then some of them she's actually cut off a little lower. And so now I have a bit more context that she's on her knees. But her <laughs> head is so much smaller than his. In the <laughs> yeah. art. She looks very delicate, like a doll. Yeah. And now that I can see this better, she also has a look on her face like, the fuck is this guy doing? Yeah. She doesn't look like she's especially happy to be rescued. No. Listeners, she's conventionally attractive thin and wearing tight clothing in case you were worried <laughs> well yes yes she is definitely not wearing now that i've seen the uncropped one her footwear is not appropriate to this level of adventure <laughs> are those flip-flops because you don't wear flip-flops to adventure that's how you get arrested they're like little strappy sandals yeah my friends got arrested because they wore flip-flops to a keg party you don't do that oh no yeah i mean that's that's like a work safe violation no, it's just you can't get away. Yeah. It's hard to run in the flip-flops. So yes, not good for adventuring. She's just all wrong. Which, frequently, the damsels are always in some kind of gear that's improbable for the task at hand. Yes, and I think that's actually why they're in distress. Is they just have, like, bunions. Oh my, if your feet aren't happy, nobody's happy. Yeah, like, like just a, a solid pair of scarpas would go a long way towards getting them out of distress in a lot of situations, you know? <laughs> All right. I'm almost... Oh, you're podcasting here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm almost done here. <laughs> Fine. We'll let you talk. Sorry. Okay. I hope there's lots of tangents at the very end. I just want to make sure that we get all the all the points down. So, quick point. I just sent a, another slide. In the mid-90s, in the ultraviolent anti-hero mid-90s, some of the stories were adapted into comics by Innovation Publishing. This was during the period where innovation was number four behind DC, Marvel, and Dark Horse. But it was a planned four-issue release, 
and innovation went bankrupt after issue three, so that never got finished. Oh, so it was a hit. Uh, and in 2008, there was a five-issue comic released by IDW Publishing on Don Pendleton's The Executioner. And it looks pretty good. Violent as all hell. <laughs> you can see on the cover that the sexy secretary count is at least up to one on this cover. Again with the footwear. But the other lady's not bad looking either. I'm not sure spines work like that, but honestly, for a comic book, that's pretty anatomically accurate. Yeah, but again with the footwear. It, it appears he's pretty... These two damsels are wearing very high heels and tight skirts. One is blonde and she's hotter than the distressed looking brunette who's also beautiful in the background. The flooring is gorgeous. Uh, and it <laughs> appears he's sticking the, the main character, Mac, is in a suit and he's roasting some paper. Yeah, and there's a, a bank vault door behind him. Like this this cover is not composed very well. So I don't know if they're inside the bank vault or they're outside the bank vault. Oh, that's a bank vault. I thought they were on a ship. I'm just, you know, I'm custler brained. He's angrily fighting a pile of paper that's on fire and he has a zippo. It looks like a teenager sending a fax for the first time. <laughs> like, how do you work this? <laughs> looks like me sending a fax. <laughs> uh, and there is one final brand of spinoff, which I don't have any covers for, but there is a France only spinoff of five books starring Mac Bolan's daughter, Kira Bolan. And they're about, like, cyber criminals and techno-terrorism. And I couldn't find an explanation. Oh, to always take it one step further and weirder. The Germans get blamed a lot for taking it weirder. The French, though, were the pioneers of just taking something <laughs> a little too far and then making it weird. They did it with the guy who uh, was in the wacky professor movies. They did it with... Uh, oh, Jerry siblings. Lewis. Get over there and made it a big thing. Yeah. I was going to say Tintin, but it occurs to me that Tintin and Babar are both uh, Belgian which are able to take things to an even weirder level than the French. I don't, I'm not convinced the people of Belgium are Earthlings. They speak very strangely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've sent two slides now. When Don Pendleton was done with Mac Bolan finally, he wrote two other successful series, and I'm not sure how successful they were, but they're written as successful. So the first one is Joe Cop, Private Eye, and these are like noir-esque hard-boiled detective stories and joe cop is this a cover is america this cover is <laughs> well, a lady a hot lady in a white bikini it's amazing the, the, these covers handcuffs have real graphic design is, is my passion vibes and bullets and a shield yes. it's i'm i'm overcome with patriotism yeah um the the psychic detective so the second one you sent i'm getting the hint what <laughs> <laughs> Why? Looks like a poster that's, um... Well, it looks like Jordan Peterson. Like a, an af a poster of affirmation that you'd find in a doctor's office. Yeah. It looks like Jordan Peterson, who smelled something bad. <laughs> yes. I was wondering if he made these covers himself. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, Joe Cop is a gigantic, unstoppable detective, uh, and opens every single book with a, well, I suppose you're wondering how I got here flashback. And Ashton Ford, psychic detective, is a private eye who used to be a naval officer and a spy and intelligence officer, and he could also see the future. This book cover, they spent dollars, maybe even <laughs> ten, designing it. Yeah. <laughs> the Ashton Ford books are ashes to ashes, life to life, time to time, mind to mind, heart to heart, and eye to eye. So he had a real theme going. Well, at least that's like a self-limiting naming convention yeah because once you start getting like next they're gonna go toe to toe what start getting like pinky finger to pinky finger you know hair to hair hair to hair again you can repeat that a lot that's true <laughs> <laughs> that's how he gets 900 um books in his <laughs> psychic detective series so at the end here don pendleton was writing lots of books about metaphysics uh, he wrote books about the spirits that he and his wife contacted through uh, seances. Uh, wrote, oh. He wrote books about philosophy. So he, like, Mac Boland was definitely a phase for him and made him all the money and let him be as weird as he wanted to be, which was pretty weird. He did a Ronald Reagan at the end there. Ronald Reagan was into, yeah, it was like he was action hero <laughs> and then he was all about horoscopes at the end. Yeah. And he made the world worse. Well, I was going to point out that didn't he kind of come full circle then? Because, you know, in the 60s and 70s, he wrote all these ultraviolet books because he hated the hippies. And then at the end of his life, he's like, 
hey, metaphysics is pretty neat. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think uh, he learned from his lessons. Yeah. When somebody gets to the metaphysics part of their life, you, you really have to check them for Fox News issues or... <laughs> uh, pardon me? And Louis body dementia. Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> either one. You're experiencing a uh, interest in this type of material. Consult your doctor. I'm in my final section now, which was legacy. There were a slew of knockoffs and copycats once Mac Boland got big, including such titles as The Penetrator by Lionel Derrick, which was 53 books. The Specialist by John Cutter, which was 11 books. The Marksman by Peter McCurtain, 23 books. The Sharpshooter by Bruno Rossi, unsure, at least 16 books. MIA Hunter by Jack Buchanan, unsure, at least 8 books. And I, I didn't even find this one on the internet. I found this one at Books and Company in town. Wow. The Terminator, no, not that one, by John Quinn, at least five books. And my personal favorite, Sending the Slide Now. What the fuck? The Sexecutioner series, each book involving a female operative working for Nympho, the New York Mafia Prosecution and Harassment Organization by Glenn Chase, at least 29 books. That probably was <laughs> what they... <laughs> NYPD named their sex crime task force. <laughs> 100%. It's not like they had, like, HR back then. Where the mafia goes, the world's sexiest crime fighter follows. Even China. Oh, the cover of this book, The Sex Executioner. <laughs> Tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> adorable, and racist all at the same time. Oh my god, one from... Oh my god. It gets... The more you look at it, the worse it gets. Cherry Delight. It's a Chinese food joke. One from oh. current A, one from column B. The, the protagonist is named Cherry Delight. I mean, that's cool. Well, it's better than Cherry's Jubilee because I get set on fire. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, there were like 30 of these books, so that might be another one of them. Uh, and the last thing I have written here is the probably the best thing that came out of the Mac Boland books is The Punisher. Marvel's The Punisher, which was explicitly inspired by Mac Boland's Executioner. We've got The Punisher to blame on this guy? <laughs> we we yeah. unfortunately do have the Punisher, yes. Okay, the Punisher as a story, get out, out, go. Is <laughs> is not a bad story of vengeance. The recent one that was on Netflix, oh yeah, a few years ago was pretty good. I really like that one. But the the merch inspires people to be such assholes. Oh God, does it ever? Yes, the uh, the fans of the Punisher can be problematic <laughs> because most miss the point. It's you. If you see the sticker, it's like a sign. Oh, yeah. Steer clear, that's an asshole. Yes. Yeah, the Punisher skull. If you see somebody in, associated with law enforcement or associated professions who has anything Punisher, whether that be the replacement for truck nuts on their own truck or <laughs> a tattoo or whatever, run. And also, be sad. That's sad. Oh, yeah. It is sad. Take a moment and, and be like, there there could have been a world without this. Well, I mean, the first thing is that their trucks were denutted. So. <laughs> it's a problem many men face. It's totally natural. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, they had to take it off to put the little, um, the little cap on their, um, on their hitch. What's the hitch hole card? On their hitch hole. Um. <laughs> With the Punisher logo. Keep it close. This is a family podcast. <laughs> That's a lie. Make a dirty step. Go ahead. Oh, gosh. I hope this isn't a family podcast. It is not. Like, he was bleeping curse words? The whole <laughs> podcast. I can control myself. I have no edit. It no. would just be one big bleep. <laughs> I only bleep actionable threats. That's fair. That's a good policy. <laughs> and to round out everything, uh, Don Pendleton died in... 1995 at the age of 67 and Linda kept doing Mac Boland stuff for 20 more years his wife props to Linda she had the formula down tongue in cheek I cannot get over that <laughs> that title that is remarkably inventive clever and horribly racist it, it's just confusing I feel confused can, can we get back to the cover because there's this <laughs> this line on the back jacket that's really standing out to me which is, uh, it goes into sort of how a Cherry Delight is a, a Chinese menu. And then it says, And like any good Chinese meal, you'll be hungry for more right after you've finished. 
Well, if these things weren't built of tropes and cliches, there'd be nothing left. That's true. Or maybe this is old enough where that's uh, seen as an original joke? Maybe. I think we're all in stunned silence now. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. One from column A, one from column B, and you'll be hungry for more. Oh, he posted more. Oh, God. Let's see. There's another picture coming my way. I wonder if, if these books are, like, worth money now or something. Cherry Delight? Chuck you, Farley. I... There's a chicken chain around here called Fuck You. <laughs> Same conceit. Uh, but I like Chuck you, Farley. Yes. And this, there's a blonde lady who's conventionally attractive in the sense that she's not a burn victim. She's just a thin blonde woman wearing a bikini. And she's holding a gun, of course. Uh, you gotta have the gun. But she kind of looks like a PTA mom. <laughs> she has like a normal looking but, body. But again, with the impractical footwear. I only see the bikini. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> and, and high heel boots. Bikini and tactical high heel boots and a whip. Yeah. Oh, no, the, no whip. Just a, she's standing on a finger. Okay. <laughs> and this is real close to copyright infringement. They were tickling copyright, copyright infringement with silver finger. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, were they ever. I have to imagine, like, each of these was, like, part softcore porn book. You think? And just, like, part spoof of whatever just got, whatever movie was just big. Like, he had to have written this in one month. Goldfinger comes out, he's like, I've got to have Silverfinger in the hardware stores in a month. And he did, by golly. <laughs> he's already got the part. It's like making Tex-Mex. You have all of this stuff, you just put it together in different ways, and you have different dishes. Well, I, I just did a racism, like the Chinese food menu. All right. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I was going to say, like, well, it's sort of a plug and play situation. Like, did, were these also published by Harlequin? Would be my question. Like, don't know. I don't see anything specific. Oh, no. Leisure books. I wonder who owned leisure books. I'm Googling as we speak. Just think of all of the cross sections where these genres overlay sex and violence and merge them together that you didn't see pre real world too. Oh yeah. So so everybody writing these was raised by people who were who either participated in or were the, the sons and daughters of people who fought a war and never spoke about it. Then went on to be current with v the Vietnam War. These stories keep coming out. Sex and violence, sex and violence. And, and uh what a interesting way to manipulate or change a society cuz it has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most of it was being done on movies and TV. But you had to have had to have the books for the readers out there. Yes, and if you're not allowed to watch things because your parents won't let you, you could hide this book under your mattress. Yeah, go down to the hardware store, buy three of them for a nickel. Yeah, steal it out of your dad's shop and read it. And be like, oh, oh. and then <laughs> as you do in the seventies or eighties, you go and leave it in the forest when you're done with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's how the next generation learns. That's culture, goddammit. Bert, for young people, there's such a thing called pornography in the woods. It was a thing. It was always there. I don't know why. It was, <laughs> at least on this continent, a universal. So the parents wouldn't find it. Well, it was a moneymaker, even if it poisoned society. The, these, uh, these books were certainly written onto the hard drives of many a young, a young man. Oh, wow. Leisure Books was also the publisher of the uh, Zane Grey, who was sort of a country western version of this and l ron hubbard oh they made bank oh yeah he must have owned them only a couple l ron hubbard books though yeah so just like they were sort of your classic pulpy cheesy horror novels in the late 80s oh yeah it looks like it was only one zane gray book that's weird i if you ever go back and watch something from the 80s i do constantly you really see the effects of uh leaded gasoline on storytelling <laughs> oh gosh and smoking inside and hair although that is actually mostly on um how old everybody looks and lunch whiskey oh breakfast whiskey stop judging me <laughs> but um yeah i mean every time i got lunch beer every time i sort of see you know movies from the 80s and they're like look at this ancient 45 year old man <laughs> i know and they're like doubled over with a cane and it's like ooh well was a good try all of our action stars now are in their 50s exactly Liam Neeson's in his 60s 
He's gotta quit soon. Niso punching people and trying to make it look believable. <laughs> Mr. Nissan, just retire. Get some voice therapy so I could hear you. Liam Neeson is actually 71 years old. Dang. Holy shit, I do not approve of him aging like that. Stop time. Why else? He moves so gracefully. That's a joke. He does not move. Right? He dated Helen Mirren for a very long time. Handsome couple. I don't know. This image of him makes me think that perhaps he's finally done being an action star. Oof. Yeah. Oh, this, this current picture of he must have some his publicist must have picked a much better one for his wiki. <laughs> so. Yeah, this this is a he lost a bet and had this taken William Neeson kind of picture. <laughs> yeah. That's him being tired and like, I dare you to cast me in another action movie. Well, Liam, you're allowed to be tired. <laughs> Alright, I have to let you guys go because I didn't realize the time. And I have two dogs snarling for my attention right behind me. Yes. Who are about to get loud and cranky. Alright. All right. Thank you both for joining. This was the life. I'll see you guys later. Yep. So see you later. Thanks, guys. See you next time, Seth. See you next time. This has been Custler Hustlers. Your hosts have been Topper and Nancy. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Custler Hustlers. Hustlers.